My name is Ulrike Passe and I'm faculty in architecture and I would like to welcome to the first Chad Hattery sponsored lecture on architecture technology at Iowa State in the architecture department. And I'm very happy to introduce you to Katrin Klingenberg, who is an architect like me from Germany. We've sort of done different paths into sustainable design. Katrin came to the U.S. already in 1994, has a degree from the same technical university as myself, but also from Ball State University. And she's worked in practice for another 10 years, until the early 2000s when she discovered that we have a problem with building buildings which use too many resources. And she at that time also discovered the Hansen House in Germany and brought that concept back here to the US to see how much of a Hansen House strategy which was developed in the temperate climate could be adapted to the US continent, the North American continent, the US in particular, but also you're working in, North in, in Canada right now. Different climates like all the climates in the world. And Katrin has been here before, in 2007, when I had just started working for Iowa State University, and we got a little grant to bring women in sustainable design to Iowa State University. And we had three female designers and engineers at that time who all made a big impact in the last couple of years. That was Katrin Klingenberg, that was um, Angela Brooks from Brooks and Scarfer did a lot of important low um, energy and affordable housing projects in the Los Angeles area. And Fiona Cousins, who is an engineer, was out, who developed a sustainable design strategy for that whole engineering design firm. So 12 years later, in 20, 2007, the Passive House was a very small non-profit. Now they have a huge footprint, a big impact in North America to bring the strategy to designers, architects, and owners, which can reduce our carbon footprint to affordable parts to net zero. So please help me in welcoming Katrin King. about uh, climate change. <laughs> I come right up with it. Um, that was my initial motivation when, in, uh, as Ulrike mentioned, in 2000 I made the decision as an architect that I want to be part of the problem solving instead of being part of the problem. And um, obviously buildings uh, have a big uh, carbon footprint in terms of operational energy as well as body carbon. And uh, you as architects, you have an incredible power and you're in an amazing position right now to really, really, really make a difference. If we can get our entire built environment for new and for retrofit down to almost nothing, to zero or even carbon positive, that, that will be huge. I mean, that, that will make a difference. So it's up to you guys. <laughs> and to go out there into the work world and require that from your employers, and I, uh, I can already tell you that's not going to be easy because people are set in their ways. Uh, so we have to, we have to together uh, create a lot of change here. Um, who marched during the climate march? One. One? Just one? Okay, you guys have some work to do. <laughs> we were in Arkansas. Yeah. You were in Arkansas? Okay. Good. So you were there in spirit. Um, so, long story short, uh, this, this is our opportunity as a profession to Share. Um, I'm going to uh, start to tell you a little bit uh, about how I got here, so just uh, give you a little bit of context, uh, maybe you can relate to it, and also about the company that we founded uh, in actually already in 2002 as a um, community housing development organization. We were promoting passive house just for that. There were just three passive buildings in 2007 when Ulrike invited me. 
Um, and those were uh, two of those were affordable projects that we had gotten funding funding from uh, from the local um, uh, local government in Champaign Urbana. So and we thought that it was a really great fit, affordable housing and almost zero energy building. So when, when I talk about PS Plus or passive building design, what I really mean by that is the um, uh, the building envelope from where it makes financial sense to jump to zero. So it, I'm talking about a very specific dialed-in envelope strategy here, okay? So it's not just like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really trying to tell you that like there are a hundred different ways to get to zero. I'm trying to tell you today that there is a very specific one, and uh, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. So, uh, passive building design standards can make a big difference uh, to guide you as designers to that sweet spot between the uh, conservation measures that you can apply in your design as well as the, the active measures like renewables, right? So we can calculate that. We, we have those computer modeling tools. We know exactly how to get to that point. And this is what these standards are about that we set out uh, when we founded the organization. Uh, to codify and pass on to you guys as practitioners so that it is easy and quick and affordable for you to make the most amazing optimization calculations that uh, other people have to pay a lot of money for. Okay, so this is what it, this is all about. So the idea here is that uh, with these building standards, we're addressing the climate crisis through passive building design, through giving these design guidelines. And the cool thing about this is we're not only addressing the climate cha uh, challenge, but we're also uh, adapting to it, right? Like, so we're making our buildings more resilient, more comfortable, in case there are power outages, because climate change is, is in progress, right? So it's, it's these two things. And uh, at the same time, we have to, what we propose to solve the problem has to be affordable to society. So uh, we need to come up with this affordable pathway, this, this economic sweet spot between conservation and generation. And of course, our vision is to make passive building commonplace uh, code, really. And uh, when we first drafted our bylaws, <laughs> we said we um, we said a very lofty goal. We said by 2020, we're going to make passive building code. So, um, strangely enough, it's happening. And I'm going to talk about this um, in a second. All right. So. Um, Quickly, just a couple of milestones so that you get. Uh, um, I'm, I'm talking probably from the perspective of the designer about a fairly theoretical concept here, but stick with me. So, uh, creating these passive building design standards so that they're easy to use for you guys, for practitioners, we had to go through a couple of different steps. Uh, we started out working with the German Passive House Institute. Uh, very early on, in 2004, actually. I was uh, involved in translating their tool into the English language, and then uh, myself built the first uh, passive house here in the United States, or uh, first uh, passive house outside of the European Union altogether, really. Uh, and we learned a few things. Um, taking that concept, as Luke mentioned, that had been developed for a moderately heating-dominated climate with no humidity problem and really no cooling problem, uh, that was a big leap of faith. We took those design principles and those kind of uh, design targets, energy targets, and uh, we designed to those. We found out that very quickly that in the United States, whoa, what a variety of climates we have, right? And um, that was uh, that was a little bit of a shock at first. It's okay, this is not one to one transferable. We have to do some work here. But then there was also a lot of promise if we could apply these principles to all these different climate zones and transfer them, right, and translate them, uh, we could have, we could develop a blueprint to solve this climate problem for the entire globe. So this is really what we set out to do, and, and we're on our way right now. So in 2011, uh, <laughs> we um, ended our relationship with the German Passive House Institute. We would have loved to keep working with them, we told them there's something wrong, you cannot just do same number, same standard everywhere. It's not getting you the, the most optimized results in terms of thermal comfort as well as some cost optimization. They said, nope, uh, our way or the highway, and we said, well, then we're, we're, we're going to go. So we went our own ways. Um, in 2012, our first step on that path was to partner with the Department of Energy and the Zero Energy Ready Home Program. And they were, strangely enough, um, on a very similar path as we were, 
And um, uh, actually, uh, the U.S. had somewhat a bad reputation in terms of energy efficiency because the codes were still really low. But the Department of Energy had already like their, their, their goal set by 2030. They wanted to be essentially at passive house levels. And they had mapped out that entire research how to get there and what it would take. And I'll show you that staircase in a second. So we partnered with them and we basically said, like, no, this is great stuff that they have worked on. Some of these things are prescriptive, but we welcome prescriptive uh, guidelines because it makes our passive building concept even better. So we started pulling together all these positive things that we could find in the construction market. In 2015, we uh, were able to publish uh, the first climate-specific passive building standard, which was a result, uh, and it came out of this collaboration with the Department of Energy and with the uh, Building Science Corporation out of Massachusetts. Some of you might have heard of Joe Stiebrick. He's a, a very well-known and respected building scientist. And uh, so out of that uh, collaboration, then uh, we created new climate-specific passive building standards that were now no longer just like one size fits all, one number for heating and cooling everywhere. Now we created dialed in specific targets for heating, for cooling, for the annual demand, as well as for peak for every location. So this is a lot of data. We ran a ton of computer models. Um, we leveraged uh, tools that the Department of Energy and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory had developed, which is called BIOT. Some of you might have uh, heard of that. That tool allows you to actually dial in that sweet spot that I started talking about. They, they have an optimizer that picks like the next most hanging fruit, that makes your building more efficient, and that calculates what then the next best measure is to employ. And then it gives you like a point of diminishing returns uh, from where it is no longer cost effective to push further into conservation because you're, you're giving back the energy savings. So any more insulation becomes more expensive it's not saving as much energy anymore, right? So um, we did that in 2015, and uh, that was hugely successful. But that's exactly when passive building started to take off, and our certification started to take off. Now I'll show you the first in a second. And then in 2018, we took it even a step further. In the meantime, we learned a few lessons. Initially, there were only single-family homes, but very quickly, after the 2015 cost-optimized standards came out, uh, affordable housing developers took to it. And they started like, applying our standards to their affordable buildings, and the buildings got bigger and bigger and bigger. So we started having three-story multifamily buildings, four-story, five-story, and now we're building high-rise affordable projects. We're not building them, but we're certifying them, and we're helping them through the design process. And I'll show you those photos at the end here as well. So 2018, huge step forward. We made those uh, standards even more granular, and that means we made them granular by building typology and sensitive to occupancy, because if you dial in an envelope, um, like internal heat gains, they, they heat your house, right? You, you, you can use those uh, and offset your heating, uh, what you would have used a furnace for uh, previously, and that's where this comes in. So this is, this is really important. I, I explain this in a second. So here's the interesting part. <laughs> right there in 2003, you can't even see it, this was my house. The 2003 is on there for a reason that's too small, but um, <laughs> there was only one. Uh, in 2007, there were two, the little green bar right there. You can see it kind of starts pop, popping up. And then uh, it took off from there, there were 11 in 2011. Uh, and now you can see how this like hockey stick curve is developing. And, and these are certified and pre-certified uh, square footages in the United States. And we're now almost at 5 million square feet. Now, my house is like 1,200 square feet. To go from 1,200 square feet to 5,000 is still a tiny, tiny share of the market. Uh, we're not done at all. This needs to go everywhere. But, uh, if this keeps doubling the way it has been doubling in the last two years, we are doing good shape. So, um, this curve box also shows that these design guidelines are easy to employ. We've been able to bring the marginal cost down, so the, the cost total kind of shrivels as soon as you get into bigger buildings. That's the beauty of it. You get the um, uh, benefit of, of scale when you build those. Um, one more thing uh, that might be worth mentioning here 
There's a little bit of confusion in the market because the German uh, Pastor Health Institute is still selling their one-size-fits-all standard. Um, but really, over the last three years, we have totally taken over the market. In the United States, we've certified 98% of all projects, and I think this uh, 2018, even 99%. People are starting to realize the power of these uh, cost-optimized targets that we have developed by location. Uh, another reason why this is so important in the United States is because most climates have heating and cooling, right? And big buildings, on top of it, they, they are more prone to be dominated by, by cooling. So this whole cool, cooling topic was a really, really important one to solve. Okay, so uh, our standards, um, you can find those documents online. They are really handy dandy little like booklets that tell you how to model to the standards and what kind of tricks to employ and stuff. Um, the 2015 one, you can see right there on the cover, most of the projects were still single family projects at the time. But then very quickly, uh, this one here actually, um, right there, this one was one of the very first multi uh, family ones in Pittsburgh. And this is one out in the Northwest. This is, a, this is actually a health facility, kind of like a, a nursing home type thing. So that's, that's how we moved into multi family. Um, and then for 2018, as I said, we made the targets sensitive to occupancy and building typology. And you can now see that the buildings are getting a lot bigger. And the other really cool thing that has emerged over the last couple of years a proof of concept. Um, dialing that envelope in to that level that we're proposing has enabled people to make these buildings zero energy. So uh, this one is a zero energy building, so zero. This one is a so zero building. Uh, this is still a rendering, but they have a canopy up on there. Um, actually, in fact, this is even a nano grid building in San Francisco in the Mission District. Very cool. Uh, this is the Rocky Mountain Institute, the innovation center, their new headquarters. This building overproduces like crazy, it feeds like five electric cars for all of them, for all the employees. If you guys ever make it to the uh, in uh, Colorado, make make it a point to go and visit that, that project. It is absolutely fantastic. This is a single family home that is a positive energy building. And this is a, a an apartment building in Philly that has this like a PV canopy. This is not sufficient to take the whole building to zero, but because they have a, an agreement with a, an electric car share company. They are able to use the electric cars as storage and through that basically make the building zero energy for operation. So really, really brilliant strategies that are now all of a sudden possible because we dive in the sweet spot for the end of Okay, so uh, codes. Uh, what to code? So 2020 uh, passing building standards code we're almost there. Uh, we, in, we actually made it into the New York State's stretch code. It was just announced a couple days ago at the uh, Getting to Zero conference in uh, Oakland. And uh, that is meaningful because New York City adopts the state stretch code right away. They won't wait two years. So the state has an option for passive building in it in the code. New York City is uh, almost already there. They, they, they are requiring everything to meet the standard now. Um, so, um, at the same time, we're also aligning with all the other uh, big organizations that are pushing for zero, that are trying to solve this problem. So, this is the zero code that, uh, from the 2030 challenge at Ms. Rio. I'm sure you guys have heard of him, right? He has been a uh, very strong advocate for the built environment to go down to zero. Um, they came, this organization came out with the zero code in uh, cooperation with the American Institute of Architects. And they are requiring, as the, the energy efficiency just, they are only requiring ashland. So that made me a little bit sad. And I'm like, yeah, no, that is not the sweet spot for the envelope. Well, we've worked and calculated and uh, really um, researched that in detail. This is not the right starting point. We're leaving savings on the table. So what did we do? We went to ashland. We said like we need an ashland standard that is a passive building design standard. And that standard uh, just got, uh, that committee just got established. So with a little bit of luck and effort of the committee members in two years, we will have an ASHRAE passive building design standard. And at that point, we will have the tool that then allows cities to plug that in uh, over there and bingo, we were there, right? 
So very exciting stuff that is happening right now. Um, uh, and a little bit more to, it's not just about the cost effectiveness and the comfort and the resilience that we're trying to get at with our design guidelines. Um, it is also about the remaking of the entire group. So if we're taking this whole challenge seriously, that we have to get to zero, and not just net zero, but uh, absolute zero, that means that we have to redo and rethink our entire grid. Um, so what you're seeing here in this slide is basically a low profile of normal buildings. Uh, over the course of uh, a couple days here, uh, just, yeah, I think it's a couple days, um, and so these are peaks in buildings that are not very efficient. Um, you have a very high low at times and then uh, not. And then this is the low profile of passive buildings. And this curve right here, this is, a, I believe this is the solar, yeah, this is the solar curve. So this, the, the, the low profiles of existing inefficient buildings and solar production, they don't match up at all. So what we had to do is, like, we had to crush those loads in the consumption of buildings down to passive building levels, and at that point, bingo, these curves are starting to match much better. And look at this one up here. There are a whole bunch of utilities. I was just like at another conference again two weeks ago at the uh, Environmental and Energy Building Association in Colorado, and their utility announced as the keynote speaker that they committed to go to 80% all renewable by 2030 and to 100% by 2050. So the cool thing here is passive building flattens out these peaks in the grid and peak demand. And with that, it basically makes the, the whole redesign of the new renewable grid much more efficient, much smaller. All the battery storage can shrink. Every kilowatt hour saved on site at the building ripples through the entire system. It, it's absolutely beautiful once you think about it. It is, it, is, it is brilliant. So that is another really strong argument for taking the entire building stock to this level of energy efficiency because it will aid the entire uh, energy uh, system down, downstream. So very, very cool. Uh, we're going to uh, see in the future, like basically, uh, a whole bunch of microgrids, like communities are going to be microgrids that can be potentially islanded. Individual zero energy houses can be a microgrid by themselves. Um, a whole uh, city area can be an islandable microgrid. And then these microgrids, they also produce, but they don't overproduce, they don't giantly produce, they produce in a controlled manner. And all that production is then being sent back into the collective grid and can be managed. There are a couple of really cool strategies that are emerging over in Europe right now. This is totally crazy. <laughs> um, they are actually starting to interlink housing units and they talk to a central energy manager. Uh, and that manager, if there is too much renewable energy being fed from the roof PV systems into the grid, the manager says, hold. Uh, and says, like, does your water heater have capacity to store? Or do you have a uh, an in-building storage system that you can turn on. Like, uh, they basically start managing demand uh, within the housing units. So the, the whole system becomes smart. Um, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very, very hopeful uh, model that is emerging. Okay, so with that, back to the standards. Um, this is the um, staircase, energy staircase, or efficiency staircase that the Department of Energy was working on when we uh, hooked up with them. And um, they essentially, um, so you can see right here, we are over here on this, on this end, this is our FIES Plus 40 certification, which means our envelope guidelines plus a PV system that takes everything to positive energy, essentially. Uh, and then our base uh, certification just for the envelope, which basically means you are zero energy ready at the cost of the whole point. Um, and these are the other programs that the Department of Energy has developed as basically a stepping stone, like a, a, a training program for the trades and for the building sector. Um, but yeah, by 2030, they will definitely want to be up here. Yeah. So this is why they are co-promoting our standards. Uh, and how do we kind of fit into the 2030 thing? I already mentioned that we were actually quite well aligning with it already, just on the building envelope level. But now we're pushing, we, we have a, a, a new certification that is somewhere halfway between uh, the envelope and zero. 
And um, that is essentially lining up with the schedule of 2030 to get to, um, to um, total zero by 2030. Okay, passive building principles, uh, building science. Um, it's not rocket science, as you guys all know. You're all employing this already in your design strategies to uh, some degree, right? So uh, the top half right here, the orange one, that is kind of like the, the, the classic passive strategies um, that, um, you know, we have a, a continuously insulated envelope, we have no dome bridging through the envelope, um, we have a very good air tightness measure, so passive building requires your building to be really airtight. A friend of mine called it like, uh, we're going to build those buildings that are so tight they're going to float in the ocean. <laughs> it's a funny thing to imagine, but it's actually true. They are super airtight, which doesn't mean that you can't breathe. Uh, they still have windows, so you can still open windows. The idea here is that the air tightness is uh, specific to the uh, to the wall element, right? If there is moisture traveling into the wall assembly and you have condensation, you have big problem. So that's one reason. Uh, if it's airtight, you almost entirely eliminate that problem and with it mold. And secondly, of course, if you have all kinds of holes in the wall, like all your energy goes up, it's not being recovered. And um, if you now have a heat recovery ventilation system that brings the air in at a dedicated portal, you can actually filter, you can recover the um, energy from the air in and out, hot or cold. And on top of it, you can also start to control humidity because you can make a heat exchange core that recovers a certain amount of humidity as well. So just following these strategies makes your building design so much easier, so much clearer, and so much less complex. Um, and then of course also the, the uh, transparent components, the windows, you want to dial those in by climate. Um, Shading devices in hot climates, make sure that uh, your building is not overheating. You want to make sure you have enough daylighting, uh, especially important, of course, in, um, in commercial projects. And then um, also the radiation control, just like the, the quality of your window. How well insulating is it? Are the window frames insulated? Is that a dome bridge or not? Um, you can, oops, you can control, uh, control all that through your, uh, through your basing component. So then there are, there's a more the dynamic side. So these components right here, simplified energy models can actually fairly accurately calculate all that stuff. So uh, we have an energy model, we developed an energy model from the Institute for Building Physics. Um, and uh, there's a simplified kind of like design side to it that uh, does calculations based on all your annual components. Uh, there are values, uh, how they perform, the air times of your building, and it is uh, using actually only monthly data, which makes it very fast. So as a designer, you can very quickly, you suck in your 3D model through Revit or what have you, uh, you assign your values to your wall assemblies, so within two hours you have a really good idea what it will take to take your building to meet the past building standards. Um, of course, if you want to go for certification, we ask you for all kinds of like, detail, you will have to kind of uh, work more on it, but initially that tool takes you right to where you need to go, and this is a great sales tool if you have a client. The client is like, oh, this is going to cost me an arm and a leg, this is going to be this weird new thing. No, just throw the design in the early stage into the model, and you have a really good idea uh, how much uh, insulation you need, what your windows need to do for you, and so forth. So those are the big chunks to, to assess uh, cost, actually. And then uh, there are dynamic um, issues that if you really want to make your building really, really good, you want to switch to the hourly uh, climate data um, mode in the tool. And at that point, you can actually model if there is humidity, if, it, if you have humidity sources inside of the building, you can actually see in the model if the humidity is getting into your walls and you can see like, if you're going to have moisture issues, depending on what kind of layers you have in your walls. So it's a really, really, really powerful tool. Uh, in practice, I, uh, if I was still practicing, it's a fabulous risk management tool because you have it all in one place. You have your hydrothermal, which means like your moisture uh, risks assessed, 
you have the energy assessed, you have all the details in it, and you can make a whole bunch of cases and it's all stored in it. You can compare them all and optimize them against each other. Uh, and then, of course, that also includes the, uh, the minimized, now very small, minimized mechanical systems. So, uh, what we're doing quits this afternoon in Ulrike's class, we didn't talk that much about it, but there, there were students who had a mechanical engineering background and are now in architecture and that made me really happy. Because this is what this is all about. It's about the whole systems design. If you design your envelope correctly, your system shrinks. It's still, still like, if you still have plenty to design, mechanical engineers sometimes get kind of afraid that we want to try to get rid of them. I'm like, no, 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 it's still intricate and, and, and important work. But these two things work together. They, the, the designer has to understand both the sides of it. It's not enough just think about the envelope. Okay, so this is a tool uh, that we're using. Um, this is Wolfie Passive from Open Institutes of Building Physics. Super powerful tool. This is a whole building uh, energy model, uh, similar to Energy Plus, but specifically designed for low load and low energy buildings. Uh, this is the our, uh, our new feature right here, so you can model a wall assembly in it, you can kind of build it, you can assign the materials, uh, then you can assign moisture sources on the inside and on the outside, run it like over three or four years, and you can see if there's actually a little puddle forming down here. So, uh, very, very powerful tool, and um, if you have that as your design tool, just imagine, like, if you design a building, ten years later there's a moisture problem, uh, somebody says, like, oh, it's your fault, you can go right back to this, and like, nope, I did my due diligence, I, I modeled this thing. Uh, somebody else must have installed something wrong, who knows what, there's a leak or something. So, uh, that model takes into account all these different factors here, the weather data, the air exchange uh, in your building, like how much fresh air are you bringing in, taking out. Uh, it takes into account the inner loads, how many people are in the building, are you cooking, uh, this is all like additional heat that is going to be affecting your overall energy balance. Um, you set the set points where the thermostat is supposed to be, and then um, you define your minimized HVAC system. And then it essentially predicts uh, your annual energy use for heating and cooling, uh, and the peak loads, peak loads meaning coldest day, uh, warmest day, how big does your minimized system still have to be. Um, so, really, really powerful. And the even most exciting part of all this, <laughs> uh, you might have heard this before, people are not very confident uh, about the predictions that energy models make. I've heard all kinds of uh, prejudices before. Uh, all uh, energy models are wrong and some are useful. <laughs> I'm happy to report that this one seems to be extremely useful because on average, we are within 7% of what our model predicts, and that's up and down. And I have not seen any other data, any other model that has that success rate. And we're not happy with it yet. Uh, we, we keep collecting data, we keep going back to our model, checking like what is not right on the money just yet, what's the problem here, what do we have to change to get this even within like 5%. Um, so very, really, really encouraging um, results. All right, to the suite of certifications. So um, we, we are trying to help you uh, pave the path to zero. And we do that by basically looking at the historic baseline. Uh, this is a very, very bad building, obviously, bright red. Um, with our envelope optimization, we're getting it down significantly. So for heating and cooling, uh, depending on building typology, for single family, you can crush the heating by 90% it's not as easy, but still by 50%. And then for multi-family buildings, because they're inherently already more efficient, uh, you can go as far as more like uh, maybe 50 or 60%. But still really, really significant and totally worth doing. So in 2018, we updated those uh, standards further, and we actually added um, more requirement to go halfway to zero. Uh, but all these, you can still choose from these options. So this is on-site, renewable, and envelope optimization. This is uh, the same envelope optimization, more renewables on the path to zero. And then we have our FIAS Plus Source Zero certification uh, that takes the building completely to zero positive energy. So why, why do we call it Source Zero? That's, that's easy because that is a much better measure 
for carbon emissions equivalent than, for example, site energy. Um, and that's really what we need to get at. And uh, especially if we now are starting to put embodied uh, energy back into the building. And we're working on this. Hopefully, in three years, we will have a carbon, embodied carbon calculator added to our modeling tool. All right. Um, basic uh, certification requirements. Uh, this is uh, important to understand. So this is the space conditioning targets. I have another slide. I'll talk about this in a second or more. But I already mentioned this. We optimize that uh, by location, by cost, and uh, it varies by climate, occupant density, envelope, and floor area. Um, then we have a very strict air tightness criteria. Uh, that's the building we make them so tight that they float in the ocean. Uh, and then we have uh, some. Uh, prescriptive requirements that we have to fulfill that are coming from the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home program, which is really good. Uh, some things need to be tested on site and they need to be verified uh, because otherwise the building will not perform. Think of your building as, a, as an engineering piece, right? You're designing it to be so efficient and effective, you need to make sure that what you specified actually went into the building, was installed correctly, and that was commissioned correctly to perform the way you had intended it. And then uh, theoretically, you probably also want to check up on it like, every once in a while, post commissioning it. And then uh, once we've done all this, optimizing the envelope of the system, then we have uh, net source energy targets on top of it. And that addresses the total energy use, not just the energy that you spend on heating and cooling and dehumidification. So at this point, you're also looking at uh, your appliances, your lighting, all of them. And that is the one that we need to take to zero. Okay, so our space conditioning targets, we are asking uh, teams to meet the heating demand annual and the cooling demand annual. We're asking teams to meet the peak heating load and peak cooling load. So again, this is um, annual total and the uh, peak describes the coldest day um, how much energy, or how big does my system have to be to meet that coldest day demand? Uh, and same for cooling. Uh, the German standard, for example, um, asked us to meet only, uh, so they only have those two, but no peak load requirement. Um, and the numbers for these two are the same. Just think about it. Like the same budget for heating and for cooling uh, anyway. It's not going to work, right? So these two need to be dialed in uh, in relationship to each other. Uh, and if you're super insulated in a very hot climate, what, what happens? You're probably making the building overheat, right? So you're, you're wasting insulation. Uh, these targets that are now dialed in, they, they give you exactly the, the complex reason. Okay, uh, enough of that, probably too much. So um, this is the BOPS kind of simplified graph here from uh, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Basically what they do, they take the baseline of the code building, number one right here, and then they um, invest in the, in the envelope to bring utility uh, bills down, right? So crushing, being cooling. Um, and at some point you get down to number two right here to kind of the, the bottom of this optimization curve. And uh, it turns out that if you push too far past this, you're pushing back up into diminishing return. So you're not getting as much savings back as you're investing in the envelope. And that's the point where you should stop. And especially now that uh, PV has become so affordable, uh, that is the exact right uh, optimization level where we want to be with our uh, passive building envelope. And that's how we set it standards for every climate uh, based on cost in North America, so for Canada and the US. We're working with uh, Japan right now, we have a partner in Japan, we're working on cost optimization for their cost structure in their clients. That will change the standards a little bit uh, for them. But all this, the idea here is to get to zero for the most cost effective. Uh, if you want to really get into the nitty-gritty, download the climate-specific passive building standards report from the NREL website. Uh, this is where we uh, explain clearly what the methodology was, how we got to these standards. 
And again, this is just a little bit more uh, how this actually works in the model. Like the, each of these dots is a measure. So let's say this is insulation, this is like slab insulation, whatever. Um, the, the next cheapest choice is the next dot. And at some point, the next dot is more expensive and pushes back into diminishing and just as a uh, reference point here for Chicago, the one-size-fits-all standards, look where they got us to. So a one-size-fits-all standard is not cutting it. It's like throwing darts and you're getting scattered. Uh, what we've done with our targets, we've, we've calibrated them so that you hit the bullseye every time. Right? So I'm um, really grateful for these amazing models that NREL has developed and uh, from Okay, uh, another shot from the model. If you want to really geek out, you can <laughs> download it, it's free. Uh, check it out and try it out yourself. I already mentioned this, this is our target here of um, reduction for single family homes 86% for heating, 26 for cooling. And uh, this is what we ended up with. We had a whole bunch of uh, thousand plus cities that we ran in this model. Uh, and um, so this we lived on our website for a while. We replaced this with a calculator. But each of these dots is a different combination of targets, specifically calculated for that location. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, so as we moved along, I mentioned we started off with very small structures, and then we moved into multifamily. And we learned a few things. So very cool. Um, big buildings, they need less insulation because they have more internal heat gains from people, appliances, and so on and so forth. But also they have a better surface to volume ratio. If you, if you think about it, a single family home has a very small footprint but relatively large surface area, which means that it loses a lot of heat, relatively speaking. Uh, that is not happening in a big building. So we found very quickly that like a tiny building in New York City compared to a big building in New York City, look at the difference in our values here. Significant, right? Amazing. So the additional cost to meet the standard for small structures is really high. I can't promise you that you can do it under 10%. There are some people out there who can. They have optimized so much and they have prefab in the, in the factory and whatever. They get it there, probably in milder climates. Um, but for big buildings, this makes perfect sense. This is not that far off from current code even. So that was really helpful. Uh, what it meant was we had to upgrade the windows some so that we wouldn't have any compensation. We had to improve the envelope a little bit, but at that point we were there. And we had to redesign the mechanical systems, uh, heat recovery, balance, ventilation, and so forth. So for 2018, uh, for 2015, we used um, a single family home as kind of like the standard setting model. We knew that that was not the best, not the most granular. But we basically figured like if we use that, with the small worst case scenario, everything bigger is easier, right? So, okay. And then people started building these big passive buildings and we're like, wow, they're leaving savings on the table. And at that point we realized we needed to make the targets not only climate specific, but also sensitive to occupancy and to building typology. Single family home is not a 10 story multifamily building, right? They behave differently. So that was, that was a really great aha moment and advancement in 2018 when we came up with a new um, standard. And now this, all these little bubbles that I showed you on the map, they are now replaced by a really handy dandy calculator where you can uh, actually dial in the floor area and the total occupancy and then it uh, spits out the target, those four space conditioning targets that you should design the envelope to. Uh, and you can set your time zone up here. And the cool part is now all those climate zones in there, they were all based on worldwide ashway climate zones. So now you can find like any climate zone in the box, not just North America. So this is an interesting one. Uh, right here, this is a, a relatively small building with four people in it. In the same climate zone, so watch how the numbers change. Heating demand, eight to six uh, peak heating load. So here the, the peak heating load is the largest and the heating demand is the largest, right? So now we go to a really big building. See what happens? The targets flip. So this is really important to realize. 
And that is the magic of the densely populated big building with a really good surface to volume ratio. All of a sudden, it's in the same climate, different building typology, you have a cooling problem. You no longer have a heating problem. And if you don't have targets that are this precise, you will get false answers. So uh, I'm so happy that we finally have this because um, I feel very strongly that we cracked that nut. Um, and again, we align with the uh, Ashray Global Climate Center. All right, a couple pictures. We're going through the hard part. <laughs> now we just have to look at like nice projects. Um, this is a really large project in Kansas City under construction right now, affordable, um, I think 275 units, very, very cool, right on the river, uh, passive project. Uh, they do have significant PV as well on the path to zero, you can see this right here. They have more on like the structures in the courtyard. Uh, this, is, uh, this was until recently the largest fully certified uh, passive building in New York City. Uh, actually in the Rockaways in Queens. It's built from uh, insulated concrete forms, which are really great because that's a, that's a construction technology that has built-in air tightness uh, in the system, right? So you don't have to plan specifically for another layer or uh, air tightness system. It's already part of the construction. And uh, this is how it looks completed. And it's an affordable project that's right there in the Rockaways on the beach. <laughs> And uh, I think the apartment itself for like uh, a one bedroom and it's New York City for 800 bucks or something like that. It's crazy. And those people have no utility for whatsoever. Um, again, also the same thing you can see right here. Uh, the developer is doing what he can to take the building as far to zero as possible. This uh, array uh, produces roughly 30% of the still remaining energy in that building. So, they are, they are on their way to zero. Um, this is uh, already completed and finished and certified. Um, I don't think they have sent an architectural photographer out to that project just yet. I couldn't find a really nice looking photo, so I'm giving the rendering. Um, this is the largest to date uh, that we fully certified in the Bronx in uh, New York City. Also affordable. Uh, interesting, these are all mixed affordable projects, like they set aside maybe 10% for the formal homeless or 20% for a certain income range. So they're really trying to actively mix, they're not, not trying to, uh, to separate. Uh, another one, Blue Stone organization right here, same thing, uh, this is also already completed, uh, we're just finishing off the certification. Uh, yet another one. And, and they all follow pretty much the same playbook. They are all affordable projects. And all of these projects have been able to come in uh, just a little bit above budget, like one to two percent. People have figured it out how to crush that marginal cost for these projects. So it's not rocket science, the market is doing it. <laughs> uh, so it's really pretty amazing. And the uh, for profit developers are starting to catch on as well. Uh, Another one, uh, all affordable in New York City. This is one that is still waiting for funding, but it is going to go. Uh, very exciting, 26 story affordable uh, high rise. And uh, this is actually an interesting one. This is uh, the new headquarters of the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency. They incentivize passive projects with a lot of points, which led to a ton of development in Pennsylvania of these projects, not as big as in New York City, but still. Um, and they decided to actually walk the top. They retrofitted their own building and added on to it, uh, and they met the fees plus standards. So the cool thing is, like, they, they have this really awesome curtain wall facade. And this, this, is, this is an engineering fee. This is like totally broken curtain wall and triple pane, very, very fine. <laughs> uh, I would not recommend that for affordable uh, construction, probably too expensive. I think it's a Shugo, a Shugo system from Europe. But um, they did it, and for them it was a demonstration object. They are walking the talk, right? And then uh, this is a, uh, an office building in Chicago. Um, unfortunately, the developer sold to another developer, and the new developer nixed the passive stuff. Uh, my friends at the architecture firm tell me they're going to still going to slide it in because they already designed it that way, and I'm just not going to call it that. <laughs> but um, uh, that project was pretty.
pretty cool because uh, that was also the first project for them and they started to learn and look at these standard details that they had been building. And they're like, yeah, no, we can do this. We, we can redesign these details and make them more cost effective and, and, and it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't cost us an arm and a leg. It's actually better. It's uh, better performing, it looks better, it's easier to build. Let's do it. So, so really, really cool stuff that's happening. Now this is the, pro uh, the project that I had uh, on the cover of one of our standards booklets. And uh, here it's built and finished, you can see right here the canopy. There's a marvelous roof deck, uh, you can look out over the mountains and <laughs> from the Mission District uh, in California, beautiful. Uh, each of these apartments, this is for profit, each of these apartments is basically a passive house apartment. Uh, on the first floor, a garage, four Teslas in it. Six I don't know, eight Tesla batteries, I don't know. That thing is, uh, is completely, so it's overproducing at times. It's selling when the rates are good. It's keeping the energy when the rates are not good. They are making money out of that thing. This is crazy. This, 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 is, this was like profitable from day one, this story. And last week I was in California for the Getting to Zero conference, and ironically on that day, um, pg e decided to shut down the power grid because it was dry, they were afraid that they would cause another fire, so on short notice they're just like, oh, oops, sorry, Berkeley, Berkeley campus had to cancel all classes for four days because pg e decided to shut down the power. <laughs> they had to try and evacuate all the monarchs from the labs, and it was like, crazy. So, this building is totally unaffected. It doesn't care. Um, it's pretty amazing. I couldn't help posting like a Facebook app. I <coughs> wish we had a PS Plus project. It didn't go there. <laughs> Gotta rub it in. Um, the keynote, the final keynote speaker at that conference was uh, Commissioner McAllister. And guess what? He showed pictures of his newly constructed passive house that he just moved into and he lives in Berkeley and he had no problem. So I had a big smile on my face <laughs> at that conference. Uh, all policymakers, code people, uh, it was completely understood that passive is the baseline for zero. No questions asked. And that hasn't happened all these years that I've been doing this, since 2002. So uh, I'm, I'm really as happy as can be right now. But I, I, I really, I'm so hopeful that we can, that we can turn this, this thing around. This is, this is the tool. You can do it. Okay, uh, not only California can do this, uh, this is again this project in Philadelphia, and uh, this developer is totally awesome, check him out on your flats. Uh, he's already on to his next project, uh, similar size, uh, that is now covered completely in PV. Uh, he's using it as his facade system, uh, in addition to the, the canopy. And these uh, solar panels actually, those are the bifacial ones that produce from underneath and from above and reflection. So they are very, very efficient. And uh, he also has his own green roof company. Uh, so the roof deck has actually grass green roof on it. And, and the two are synergistic. The, the green roof and the deck cools the panels and makes them even more efficient. So it's, it's all so fun. Oh, and um, I don't have a picture of this, but he has these little like LED lights in the windows. And the windows are linked to the energy performance of the person who lives in the apartment. So if you're a real energy hawk, your window will light up red at night. <laughs> if you're a really good person, your window will light up green. But it then, then says like, well, but we don't, like, we, we mix them all up. It's not associated, so we're not calling anybody out. But, um, so uh, the building will know <laughs> just by the glow of the building how well they do. So pretty fun feature. Um, down here you can see this piece of the garage, this is uh, where the uh, electric cars for sharing for a little bit. Pretty cool stuff. And then of course the Rocky Mountain Institute, we're so proud of this project. Uh, this was a critical project for us because we had just come out with the 2015 Passive Building Standard. And Amory Levins and I, we've been friends. And uh, I knew that he was working on this and I'm like, well, you know what? Um, I think the new standards, that's, that's right on the money. It looks like you, you guys did exactly what we would have said. Oh, okay, um, we paid like, uh, I don't know how many engineering firms to run 76 energy models and cost optimization studies. And um, yeah, sure, you, you go ahead and, and calculate it too. Right on the money. 
we came up with the exact same answers in a model of one day. <laughs> no more 76 energy models. Not trying to put the engineers out of business, but if we architects can have that powerful tool in our hands to get design feedback right from the beginning, right? Like, throughout all this disconnect with like, oh, can I, can I talk to my energy model, please? Like, could you make a decision? No, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, bad decision made. So, um, and we're doing the same thing uh, again right now with the uh, American Geophysical Union in Washington, D.C. First retrofit, zero energy, kind of like a, a bullet center in Seattle, you might have heard that. Has a big canopy on it, same thing. They, they, they ran a ton of energy models. Um, I was doing energy and we're offering the same thing, right? And we apply our standards, and if that is again uh, right on the money, then, then we know we, we really have a nice shortcut that we can push out into the market. And then there's the finals. Um, I finally, after 15 years, decided I've had it and I've got a PV system on the roof. It has been just passive until like last year. Um, and you can see right here, this is tiny, right? It's still plenty, plenty space. That thing overproduces enough so that I can drive around 10,000 miles per year with my electric car and heat the coal and do whatever I need to do in the building. Um, so this is the great promise. Um, we're here. We're here. You do it. And uh, we even can do it for retrofit. We're working with a Dutch company and the Rocky Mountain Institute to develop industrialized, prefabricated, high-performance panels that can be used to cost-effectively apply these standards and principles to take existing buildings to zero. First the envelope to our sweet spot, and then the mansion to zero. And that is so exciting because new construction is a thin sliver, right? We need to get to the existing building stock. No questions asked. And at that point, the embodied energy is right front and center. No, 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 it's so important because if you over-insulate and you uh, retrofit the entire building stock, you might be, might be kicking the planet in the butt and we'll never be able to recover from it. So you need to be very mindful of how much energy is in your materials that you're doing this measure with. So again, back to all this optimization, I'm not trying to be nitpicky or whatever. Yes, I'm German and I really like to do detailed stuff. But in this case, we really have no other choice. We, we need to be as precise as we can because we fell asleep on the wheel over the last 40 years. Known all this stuff for 40 years, so we decided to ignore it. Now we really need to take it to the end. But we can do it. Alright, one more slide and then you guys can go home. <laughs> we can go to bed. Um, uh, another multi family project, first one in Seattle, super exciting. Um, actually, uh, this developer's second project, I was there for the recent door door test and they killed it right out of the gate. <laughs> So even the air tightness is no longer being debated once the, the builders figured it out. So passive building, that is our zero energy ready sweet spot. Let's work on it, let's get every envelope there. It should be cold already today, we have some time to lose. Um, thank you guys, I hope this is useful to you.
And now, if you put a whole ton of like internal loads into like people cooking and stuff, yes, then the pendulum swings to having a cooling dominator in the same time. It's counterintuitive. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily think that that's what happens. Yeah. I have a question. I, um, I'm an architect in Des Moines, and I have a client that wants to do. I'm not sure if one can go all the way to pass the house, but he wants to do a high performing single family residence. And um, we're, we're just starting to research it and looking at different wall assemblies. And I'm, I'm kind of overwhelmed with it because, um, as, as a, a residential architect, I mean, there, you know, when I go on the uh, Building Science Corporation website, I was on the like, I mean, there's, there's probably you know, like 10 or 15 different types of wall assemblies, and then you read different blogs, and I say, well, this one, you know, like, for instance, the XCFs. I mean, I They are talking to the building science community. Huh? They are talking to the building science community. Well, I, you know, I'm just wondering, is there a guy, you know, to make this more um, user-friendly yeah. for home builders and kind of average people, is there going to be kind of a prescriptive, like, you know, for this climate, this is how you, you know, would design a, this is the best envelope design. So yeah. architects don't have to do all this research, which a lot of us, a lot of clients don't want to pay no. for. You know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so my guess is that that is uh, one outcome uh, from the ASHRAE 227P Passive Building Design Standard effort. That um, we still will be like performance modeling for big buildings for sure because they all have envelope consultants in. so they, they they have that already budgeted in. But for single family, I think we will have some prescriptive uh, stuff come out of it. But for the time being, uh, this is uh, we also train architects. We have a, a, a training mm -hmm. executive program. Uh, you get a, a professional certificate at the end. It's called CPHC, Certified Passive Consultant. And that is essentially giving you all these tools in short, like in a very condensed form. And the uh, modeling tool that I mentioned, the multi passing tool, that has it all baked into it. So if you practice that some, you should be able to totally do that. Mm -hmm. And um, there are some uh, manufacturers now that are making uh, prefabricated panels that meet these levels of insulation. Uh, I would look at uh, Build Smart for, for you. Okay. They are in Lawrence, Kansas. Oh, they have a built-in uh, air tightness strategy. Uh, they can they can help you with this. Thank you. Do you have a question? I have a question. Yes, I, I saw your your climate map of the yeah. US, and I'm always kept, uh, a little concerned when I see the the line between the climate zones. Yeah, in me too. In Iowa, you know, we once had the barrier between climate zone five and four right along Highway 80, uh, Interstate 80, right? Now it's kind of migrated into Minnesota. Mm -hmm. we, we are getting warmer. Mm -hmm. So these climate challenges, <laughs> the changing, the crazy weather we're having, mm -hmm. is that, can you integrate that in your tool? Yes, so you can certify using future climate data. Um, so we're using a, a Swiss tool to, be, um, to create the climate data that our model accepts. And that has a future climate data function. So for those maps which you've seen, you know, if you, I started here working with, with climate zone, where literally it was fine. Mm -hmm. It said 80, the difference between the two zones, and now you guys, mm -hmm. you know, the, yep. the change between the two zones yes. is a nice city, right? But then again, nobody can predict and that's the base, okay. But that's based on past data, that's on measured data. Yes. Right? So we, we, yes. there are changes happening. Yes. Although we have had the Arctic vortex last Well, well that, that, that's just it. So my, my biggest concern with that one is, um, so for one, that, that map that, that you mentioned that made concern, um, it's a little bit confusing uh, because like we have the time zones and all the bubbles are the same color. Um, the, all, all the targets are different, even if the bubbles are the same color. So in that sense, that map is a little confusing, right? But in terms of future climate data, my biggest concern would be that you're designing your wall assembly in a way that it is, um, um, I don't know if you guys have 
that building science education uh, already building <laughs> your head. But I have to blame. There, there, there is a vapor control layer in the wall, right? The wall like dries to either side of that thing. Um, and based on climate, you need to watch out about this moisture problem. You cannot have like a vapor sandwich or whatever. The, the wall needs to be able to dry one way or the other. So um, at that point, I always refer when people talk about the future of um, uh, whatever climate data and shifting of climate. The biggest danger really is that you're designing a wall for a climate that needs to breathe from both sides, or that needs to be diffusion open, and then like uh, the climate migrates away, and then your wall is the wrong type of wall, right? So at that point, um, I, I accidentally did this on my house, and I didn't really need to, but I essentially designed the perfect wall that Joe Stewart recommends, and that's it. Design a perfect wall. And perfect wall means what? Uh, usually frame and then foam on the outside. And the thickness of the foam, uh, that really uh, should be dialed in by climate, but since it's like it gets warmer northward, <laughs> uh, which is good because a little bit more insulation won't work. Um, if, uh, if the climate migrated the other way, <laughs> you might get into trouble. So remember the perfect wall. That's the solution. Yes, yes. And then can you speak more about uh, what you're doing going forward to like tap into the existing buildings? Because you said that's the biggest part of it. Yes. Super exciting. So uh, the Netherlands, unbelievable. Um, they, they started having earthquake problems, not because they have an earthquake zone, but because people are fracking and they don't want to be dependent on Russia, so they were trying to get their own gas out of the ground. So all of a sudden the whole house fell in and they got a huge disaster. So, uh, the Dutch government decided to get off of gas. And what do they do to do that? They wrap every single house in a super insulated envelope, uh, prefabricated roof panels with PV on it, and they take every building to zero. They, that's, that's their mandate. They're doing it. It's, it's crazy. Like about 20,000 units, well, they should be doing 20,000 units a day. They're not there yet, but they're scaling up, and they're serious about it. So uh, we've been working with RMI for a couple of years now to bring that concept to the United States and to do the same thing over here, which is a heavy lift because, for one, we're still trying to uh, figure out the components. We, we, we're trying to kickstart an entire industry, prefabrication of high-performance panels, <laughs> uh, and then installing them, and then telling, basically, uh, the states that they, I just recently did the math, if you only look at housing units to meet our, our carbon goals by 2050, we need to retrofit 12 and a half thousand uh, units a day from here on up, from today. Um, so that's a, that's a challenge, right? That's, that's a whole wartime effort. Um, and that's, that's what we're working with RMI on and our Department of Energy and Nice Soil in New York State. And um, yeah. So, but we're doing it. Yeah, yeah. We're doing it. Yeah. I take one more question for anyone. Yeah. Um, I know these are like passive strategies, but what are your thoughts on active strategies? Like current state of active technology and climate control and uh, things like uh, Al Bahar Towers starting up in Abu Dhabi with active systems. What are your thoughts on that? Are you, are you uh, talking like carbon scrubbing or? Um, more like uh, active shading that opens the filter. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Electro no. and glass to change depending on temperature. Oh, good. Yeah. As long so, so the, the hard part is always the cost barrier, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if, you may, if you have a technology that's too expensive, you, you just can't afford it. The market mm -hmm. can't afford it. It won't, won't do it. Uh, we're still battling to get that additional marginal cost down that it costs to do all this compared to baseline. Mm -hmm. So um, that's that's why I like keep it simple and not too overly complicated. Mm -hmm. Stay away from like the technological Christmas tree mm -hmm. yeah. uh, stuff that moves brakes. <laughs> uh, kind of mm -hmm. a common sense design strategy, I guess. Well, thank you so much, Katrin, again, and thank you all for coming, and I hope it was inspiring for your future as designers. Thank you. Thank you.